You may be seated. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. The portion of God's Word on which we reflect a bit this morning is the Word of God recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 5. I will, in the sermon, give you a little bit more context for these words, but we'll be focusing on verses 29 through 32. And they read, Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is God's word. Yeah. Dear friends, in Jesus, a number of years ago, my family was blessed to have the opportunity to take a vacation to Hawaii. And one morning, we were heading out to one of the beaches on the north side of the big island. It was maybe just about an hour or so after I'd been in the ER getting stitches in my hand. It's another story for another day. <laughs> we were heading out to the beach, and my wife said, before we head out there, I need you to read these, these couple sentences from the tour guide book, and she Put it in, in front of me and I read and it said, as you head out to the beach, you will notice on the left-hand side of the beach, a massive cliff jutting out into the ocean. You may even see some numbskull 20-something year olds jumping off that cliff. Don't even think about it. <laughs> so as we headed out to the beach, I looked to my left and there's this beautiful cliff that is jutting out into the ocean. The waves are crashing against the base of it. And that cliff was calling to me. <laughs> and my wife, who knows me well, said, Did you not hear what you just read? And I said, Yeah. That book said that numbskull 20 something year olds shouldn't jump off that cliff. I'm a well grounded 40 something year old, and I've got to jump off that cliff. Why do we do what we do as Christians? Because we got to do it? Because we have to? Because we must? Well, yeah. But not in terms of the law, like you have to do it or else death and hell await you, but rather in terms of the gospel, in terms of love. Heaven awaits us, guaranteed. The love of Jesus compels us. The God of, of the gospel and his love draws us to obey. We must obey God. Got to do it. Take the early Christians, for example. On the day of our lesson, the Christian church was still in its infancy stages. It had just been weeks since Jesus had ascended into heaven. And ten days later, kept his promise to send the Holy Spirit, who in wonderful fashion kicked off the public gospel ministries of the apostles. The gospel was being proclaimed by any number of people, the, the early Christians were very active in just sharing their faith about their risen Savior. The apostles were preaching and teaching and healing in the temple courts. And through all of this gospel activity, the Holy Spirit was, was bringing people, calling people to faith and adding them to the number of believers. But as you can imagine, the, the Jewish religious leaders were not thrilled at the gospel's early success. They thought that with the death of Jesus, they had also brought about the death of the teaching of, of him and his name. But Jesus' death, his crucifixion, and of course his resurrection had only fueled the fire. Jesus' teaching, his name, and of course as we know, Jesus himself were alive and well. So the Jewish religious leaders figured that they had to do something. They had to do something serious. They had to do something swiftly. And so they had two of the apostles, Peter and John, arrested. They threatened them. They interrogated them. They told them not to dare mention the name of Jesus again. To which the apostles replied, We can't help but speak about what we have seen and heard. That only infuriated the Jewish religious leaders further. So again, they had the apostles arrested, but this time not just Peter and John, but all of the apostles. They threw them into prison under guard overnight as they figured out what to do with them. 
But unbeknownst to them, and in fact, even unbeknownst to the guards who were watching them, the Lord sent an angel who escorted the apostles out of prison. And, and before he dismissed them, he gave them these marching orders. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. So when the Jewish Sanhedrin gathered together again the next morning to, to figure out exactly what to do with the apostles, to their surprise, the apostles weren't there. In fact, someone said they're back out there again in the temple courts preaching and teaching about Jesus. And as you can imagine, the Sanhedrin was, was not amused. They brought them before them again, and Caiaphas the high priest said to them, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. The Sanhedrin's orders were clear. They were firm. And they came with threats of serious consequences were those orders not adhered to. However, the apostles had been given other marching orders. And, and not just through the angel the night before, but God the Eternal Son himself had said to them just weeks prior, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. The risen and victorious Savior of the world had personally said to them, preach the good news to all creation, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Just before himself returning to heaven, where to this day Jesus rules over every authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth, Jesus had said to these men, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So here stood the apostles, witnesses of history's most consequential events, Sent out by the Lord Jesus himself to testify of these things to the world. Now in that moment, standing before some of the land's highest authorities, threatening them even with death, were they not to cease and desist? Well, the decision was a no-brainer for the apostles. We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as Prince and Savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The apostles had a higher authority to answer to, the Lord of heaven and earth. They had a message that was worth dying to communicate just as it was, Jesus died to put it into effect. And, and that was the forgiveness of sins and a relationship of peace with God for all eternity. How tragic would it have been had these men caved to the pressure? Had these men who were... Eyewitnesses to the gospel, personally sent out by Jesus to testify of these things to the world, had these men buckled down and, and, and caved in and remained silent and not shared with others that one saving message that rescues souls otherwise bound by nature for hell. In fact, do it. It almost been criminal had they not carried out those marching orders issued to them from the Lord. We must obey God rather than human beings. We've got to share this message at all costs. So for the last 20 some years, Las Vegas has been home to me. And I'm sure that many of you are at least in some way familiar with the, the Las Vegas based magic duo, Penn and Teller. Penn Gillette is the, the taller of the two men. Uh, he used to have a ponytail. He's cut his hair. He's got shorter hair now. Um, he's the one who does all the talking in their act. Both of those men 
are avowed atheists, outspoken atheists. It was very interesting. A number of years ago, Penn Gillette was waxing eloquently into his computer one night on a video blog, and he was, he was talking about how ridiculous the message of Christianity is, how foolish Christians have to be to believe this, this gospel stuff. But in the midst of that, he said something interesting. He said the only Christians that he had any respect for were the Christians who tried to witness to him. He explained why. He said, if you truly believe in your heart of hearts that Jesus is the one and only, the eternal Son of God and Savior of the world, that, that the only way to be saved from your sin is through faith in this Jesus, that otherwise you will spend an eternity in, in, in a place of unending agony and torture. If you truly believe this and, and choose not to tell me, so how, how cold, how heartless can you be? In fact, he called such a thing criminal. <clears throat> The kind of Christians who, who truly believe what the Bible says about Jesus and, and about he being the sole source for our salvation, who, who cherish that enough to not only know it, take it to heart, live by it, trust it, build their lives around it, but also share that with others, those kind of Christians have the respect of even an avowed atheist, the likes of Pendulette. Are you one of those kind of Christians? Not because you want to earn the respect of Penn Jillette, but because you, like your Lord and Savior, want all people to be saved and to come to the saving knowledge of the truth, the truth of the gospel. That Jesus lived the only perfect life on record. And he did so to earn our righteousness, to become our righteousness before God. That Jesus then took that perfect life and was cruelly crucified upon the cross to suffer the penalty for sin, all sin, your sin, my sin, their sin, whoever they may be. And that he then, three days later, miraculously, inexplicably, unbelievably, and yet undeniably, rose physically from the dead. And that because he lives, we too, though one day we also may die, will be raised, purified, and glorified like him to be with God in perfection for all eternity. That is a message that can only be believed if heard. It can only be heard if shared by someone like you. Someone who knows and treasures that message of the gospel. <laughs> And is willing to step outside of our comfort zone to share that with those who are living and, and, and dying without it. And that includes everyone. In fact, the apostles realized in that moment that, that everyone included the very men who were demanding their silence. It's pretty remarkable if you put these words in their original historical context to realize that among the very first people to ever hear that God's plan for salvation had now been fulfilled and was being distributed freely were the very men who orchestrated the crucifixion of Christ. The very men, humanly speaking, who brought about the death of Jesus. And yet that is the nature of God's grace, isn't it? It's unconditional. It's undeserved. Forgiveness of sins is needed by everyone. Forgiveness of sins is available to everyone. A couple springs ago, there were a series of, of church arsons in the state of Louisiana. Over the course of 10 days, three historic Baptist churches serving predominantly African American congregations were burnt down to the ground by a 21-year-old man who, it appears, had some connections to the white supremacist movement. Shortly after those fires, Good Morning America came in and interviewed one of the pastors of one of those <coughs> congregations, and it seems that Good Morning America was looking for some good sound bites about the state of racism in the American Deep South and, and a rally cry to rise up against white supremacy or, or something along those lines. 
But what they got was a clear testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The pastor was asked what he'd like to say to the guy who, who did this. The pastor is standing in front of a 100-year-old charred pulpit holding a Bible that somehow had survived the fire inside that pulpit. When asked, what would you like to say to this guy? said, I'd love to have the opportunity to tell him that I forgive him. The Lord has forgiven me for everything that I've ever done. I've got to forgive the guy. Another one of the local pastors was interviewed by a local television station, and that pastor said, a lot of people want to make this a hate thing. Well, we don't represent hate. We represent love. Indeed. How about you? You may not have had your church or your house burnt down by an arson, but you have been burnt before by a person or two who has tried to cheat you, take advantage of you, ruin your reputation, give you a bad name. You may not be given the opportunity on national television ever to give a clear gospel testimony to Jesus Christ, but, but God has and he will continue to give you opportunities to testify of him to a friend, a relative, an acquaintance, a neighbor. You may not be asked by a local TV reporter what you'd like to tell the guy who so personally hurt you, but you might be asked by the guy who hurt you. Human beings would say, give them hell, make them pay. You don't get off the hook that easy. But the heart of faith says, I must obey God rather than human beings. <laughs> and how do you do that? Uh, when, when the pain is that real and that raw, when the sin was that offensive, when the damage that is done may be difficult, maybe even impossible to repair? Well, the apostles gave us the answer, didn't they? The Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, who dwells within you. The Holy Spirit who came into your heart and into your life through the waters of baptism and through his word. He continues to strengthen and equip you in your faith through, through the Lord's Supper. The Holy Spirit who has called you to repentance. And forgiven you of all of your sins. Who has worked within you that gift of faith. Who has sown within you those fruits of the Spirit. Who has woven in your being his love. And who then enables you to share those very things with those that the Lord places around you in your life. God has raised Jesus from the dead. He is Prince and Savior to this day. He rules not only throughout the universe, but within your heart and in your life as Prince and Savior. God wants all people to know about this. And he wants some of them to find out about it through you. So, whose orders will you obey? And, and I am not suggesting that we openly defy whatever rules may exist at your place of employment about proselytizing on the job. Jesus himself says we need to be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. We need to be we need to be smart about how we go about doing this. What I am saying is that we need to be much more bold as 21st century Christians in obeying the Lord and in, in defying those unwritten and yet very real societal rules, cultural rules related to religious indifference and intolerance, which is willing to tolerate anything but the truths of God's word. Or this attitude that is permeating out there that anybody's religious thoughts or beliefs or spirituality is, is their own private business. That in the end, it's, it's all the same. And that anybody who believes that their God or their religion is superior is only ignorant. These are lies of the devil. And may there be a little fear or apprehension as you reflect upon and consider being a bit more intentional in sharing your faith, making that leap of faith? You think there was a little apprehension as my toes were out over the edge of that cliff looking at the crashing waves below? 
Yeah. yeah. And yet there is a certain thrill, a certain rush in obeying the Lord in this way. And you add to that all the Lord's promises related to testifying to our faith, and, and it makes that leap far less frightening. Share just one example with you. The Apostle Paul wrote, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Jesus is Prince and Savior. He's the only true and ultimate authority over all things in heaven and on earth. And it is my prayer that he himself will give you the desire, the, the courage, the capacity of love, to join the apostles and saying, we must obey God rather than human beings. I can do this. I've got to do this. Amen. May that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds right here in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the singing of our next anthem, I Love to Tell the Story. Thank you. 